Today we have a story and a war story, which they're both sort of like war stories. And all that, and it sort of felt like a war story to somebody involved. But anybody that has ever bought any steel on wheels knows how excited you can get about driving the one you just bought, even if it's a ready old rusted out pickup. When you buy it, you want to be driving it just as quick as you can get behind a wheel if it runs. You know what I mean? Now, this one guy that I know that said the first car he ever bought was a Pinto that he paid three thousand dollars for, and they dragged it to his house because it wouldn't run. I'm not kidding. That's the guy that I put him in a note. But uh, uh, now, when we're driving a newer vehicle, like you know, like uh, Jonathan uh, wrangled him a deal on a Mustang that he's been driving here lately, and all that. Uh, he, uh, but basically, you got. We enjoy this human attention. Vehicles do. Now, what happens to a vehicle if you park it somewhere and leave it set a while? Burns. Up there in the uh, on Crawford Street, which is right over close to where he lives, there is, and you've seen this car, there's a blue, like a 05 Toyota Camry sitting there rotting away. Yeah. You go, I, just, I mean, it's a beautiful car, but it's just sitting there with the weeds growing up around it. And I've often thought about the comments and ask them, what's the deal on that car? You know what I mean? What's up for that? Right. Now, my dad had a far, opened a foreign car garage in 1961 with no training, no shop manuals, no wiring schematics, just the experience game with his dad rebuilding old tractor engines. That's how he started out. Now, I will tell you that initially when he opened the foreign car garage, he hired a bunch of people, you know, to, to work with him that were mechanics that had, you know, some factory training and all that. And he learned some stuff from them. But he also had a body shop and other kind of stuff. My dad could do a lot of stuff. And there's my dad there at his shop. Uh, the one that he had out on the uh, highway. You know where uh, Coppinville Road comes right out on the four lane, right there in Enterprise? Mm -hmm. In the middle of the eastbound lane was where his shop was before eminent domain, you know, got it. But anyway, he drove a whole bunch of them. This right here was his favorite car. This is the one he built from the ground up that he, you know, you get all the, you might know that not every, even if you work on lawnmowers, there are some of them that have better engines and they work better than others. Some of them start better, you know what I'm saying? It's, they're not every, and he found all the best stuff that he cherry picked from, that he managed to get his hands on. And he built this car from the ground up. And that was a car that he really, really enjoyed doing. Now, he eventually scaled back from working on 28 different kinds of foreign cars to working on just Volkswagen bugs in his rural repair shop for a lot of years. He had lost the lease on the original building because they sold it to a bank. And so he had to, uh, he opened a one-man shop because he said when he had all these people working for him, he was taking in like, and this was in the real early 60s, he was taking in $120,000 a year and bringing home 100 bucks a week for himself, you know, because his overhead was so high. Well, he started making pretty good money even in a one-man shop. And it would work on Volkswagen bugs and buses. All you had to have was just jack stands and, uh, you know, jack and jack stands. You can have the motor out of a Volkswagen bug if you know what you're doing in about 30 minutes, you know. Uh, but for a long time before he fixed the transaxle, it would jump out of gear. And so he drilled a little small socket in the gear shift knob and used a stiff piece of welding rod propped between the knob and the dash to keep it in fourth gear. I thought that was kind of funny. But see, it was basically, he knew what he needed to do to fix it. He just couldn't get around to it because he's fixing everybody else's car. That's how that goes. Well, I was pumping gas for 40 cents a gallon. Did brakes, built carburetors, fixed flats, and all that stuff in the Gulf Station, that level planes. It looked a lot like that. No veranda. When the people showed up to buy gas, it was because it was raining. And they didn't, you know, we were self-serve. I mean, we were, excuse me, full serve, and they wanted to go to self-serve, which you had both in those days, uh, in the 70s. And uh, whenever they would come to us, it was because the weather was really bad or whatever, so we'd have to stand out here in the rain pumping our gas and all that. A little bitty community there, but Ed, the guy that ran the gas station for his dad, Clyde, moved to Texas coast to work on the offshore services business as a helicopter mechanic, because he had that training. The oil was 13 bucks a barrel then, money was flowing like water down there, so he says, go down here, and work with me in Texas. So I worked that job for a few years. And after I married, I found myself needing a gas saving ride. So I asked my dad, I says, uh, I need a bug. So he says, well, I'll say in a 66 model I've been driving. You know, it's kind of like my dad's, he's a generous guy. You know, he sold me his favorite car and all that. And it was a story. By this time, it was painted something between a pale yellow, yellow and a pastel green. Well, in the meantime, he, you know, the government bought the land that his shop was on. This was my Uncle Earl standing in his shop drinking coffee one morning, and he noticed he's got a couple of cars in there he's working on and all that. So he didn't want to buy an expensive piece of land in town. He figured he'd have to go in and do that. So he had a piece of land out there next to where we lived, 
And so he built a shop out there. Then he put a sign up. He said, if, they'll, if, they, if they find me, they'll find me. You know? And everybody figured out, found out where he went. They would go because he had a pretty good name you know, for fixing those bugs. And those bugs were everywhere back then. They were, those things were running all over the place. You don't see very many of them now, but they were everywhere back then. And sometimes he'd make $1,000 a week just working right by himself on the bugs. You know? But anyway, he had a lot of regular customers. Well, while this was going on, I was living in Texas. I bought this house. That's my pickup. And there was this fleet maintenance job. A fleet maintenance job means basically you take your uh, all of the vehicles that you're responsible for, the forklifts and everything, and I had a couple of guys that worked under me, and they'd go out there and they check the oil and the water and all that kind of stuff on them every day, and you know, the battery water, and they fill up with fuel. They had a truck that they would do that with. And uh, it's kind of funny, <laughs> one of them was filling up a crane. We had these, these big hose reels on the back of the truck, you know, whether they needed oil or, or fuel or whatever. We built the truck, you know, and all that to do this with. And one of them was up here on the, uh, the catwalk on his crane, and he was filling it up with diesel. And something happened, and I don't remember if we got locked in the park break or whatever, the truck started rolling away. And he's up here holding on to the hose, trying to hold this ton and a half truck, you know? <laughs> I almost dragged him on the thing. I think I'm thinking about that every time. But anyway, uh, I bought that house for $16,000, and uh, the Volkswagen Bug was one of our family vehicles. I moved back to Alabama and came home with us. Well, we moved back. My dad had temporarily closed his shop. He was in Tennessee learning about sawmills with plans to set up one of his own out behind the shop to supplement his income when the car work was sold. So after he got his sawmill set up, there he is running his sawmill. I built a four-bedroom house with oak lumber we saw out of the eight trailer truck loads of logs I bought. It was 40,000, you know, board feet of lumber we saw out of that, and it was oak. So basically, during the time he was in Tennessee, though, I was the one-man operator of a shop for a little while, so I serviced vehicles. I was basically working on cars. That's how I was making my living for a while. I was just running his shop. Well, this girl named Patty showed up. She was a little gal that had, you know, she had three kids, and she was a single mom and all that, and she had bought this little car right here from a car dealership over in an adjoining town that I'm not going to name from a guy whose name I'm not going to say. But anyway, it was a nice-looking little car. And that car, it was that year model. It looked just about like that. Okay, so uh, anyway, she wanted to have some work on it, so I worked on it. Now, you got to, on a Volkswagen Bug, you had to change the oil over 1,500 miles, and the valves had to be adjusted regularly, and the brakes had to be adjusted regularly, but Volkswagen Bugs took a lot of maintenance. You know what I mean? They just did. That's one of the reasons my dad liked them, because people were always need work done on them. Right? Well, anyway, so here we were. I was working on her car in that shop in the country. I looked out there, and it was raining. And she had disappeared, and I was finishing my service on her bug. I realized she was approaching, and she was soaking wet because she'd been walking in the rain. She was kind of a flower child, you know what I'm saying? All right, so I said, what happened to you? She said, I just went for a walk in the woods. So she came, you know, this peace, joy, love, hippie kind of stuff, you know what I'm saying? She's one of those kind of people. Well, over the next month or two, she got called me. Every time I turn around, she's calling me. She says, I'm at the bus station over here, and my right front wheel is trying to fall off my car. And I went over there, and she had a bearing had gone bad, and it was like a cartoon car, a car tired wobbling. So I fixed that. And then the, the spring on her points broke in the distributor, and so on and so forth. There's all kinds of stuff. And then one day, the belt broke. This belt drives the generator. It also drives the fan that cools the oil cooler and the blows down across the jugs and all. And so it took the temper out of the rings on the car because it got overheated. I mean, it, every time you turn around, something was going wrong with this car. It was really a sort of a horror story. But I kept working on it. Finally got it all straightened out. I went ahead and put, that's what the, the engine looks like, put it apart. I jerked it out of there and I pulled it apart and I put rings in it real quick and got it going for it. Charged her something like $45 because the rings didn't cost very much. And uh, one way or another, got her back over there. So one repair after another, she got so disgusted with it that her hippie smile disappeared, and one day she was frustrated. I'm sick of this car. It's giving me a hard time. All right. And so funny thing, I says, I got this '66 VW. It was four years older. Wasn't this nice looking and all, or comfortable? And I says, uh, I just put a brand new tractor exhaust system on. And I'll trade with you. She said, Even money? I said, Yeah, I'll trade with you even money. And so all we had to do in those days was just swap tag receipts because you didn't have to have no title <laughs> back in them days. I mean, not all cars that age, right? So. She, I said, I drove it all the way here, drove it around, so she, she did this. So it was driving, it was a lot more comfortable than the 66 model I had. And so for cars of that vintage, no title was needed. So anyway, we did that. So she still brought the 66 model bug that dad bought, I mean built, over there for me to work on periodically. 
and I was like, every time we it needed work done on, I worked on it and everything. So, uh, and she was just happy as a lark with that car. She just drove it everywhere, and she'd go to the beach with her kids and all that stuff. So, anyway, right before Dad came back from Tennessee, the guy I worked for at the Gulf Station had built a new shop, and he had more work than he could do. So, I that's when I had closed Dad's shop, and I went to uh, work up there with Ed again. And uh, so, Dad came back from Tennessee. And before he got his sawmill set up, he opened his shop and was running it again for a little while. So there wasn't very much of a hiccup there. But I told him I had swapped that 66 Volkswagen bug for the 70 model bug that this girl had. So he says, you know, we laughed about it. He says, you traded my good car for a piece of junk. You know, and I said, well, it was a not nicer car. And so one night when we were off work, my dad says, I looked up out there that day and that 66 Volkswagen came driving into my yard. And she got out, and she says, where's Richard? And he says, well, this is my shop. He was just running it for a little while. Uh, so she says, well, I'm not letting you work on my car. He built it from the ground up, and she wouldn't let him put it around. <laughs> that was really funny. I mean, that was really, really funny. All right, so anyway, uh, that was the little thing. Now, now I'm going to the regular war story. This is a more recent so I got my dad's 96 Chevy pickup and a couple of other vehicles. Now, uh, this Mazda 6 had run into a concrete post. And what it did was it busted the bumper, it busted the radiator support, and it also caved in the radiator and the uh, AC condenser and made them into a nice French curve. Right? They weren't leaking. The air conditioner still worked. The radiator wasn't leaking. But boy, were they ever bent. And so we had to put all of the those parts on the front of that. And there's Bobby putting all the parts on the front of that one there. He had to put a new bumper on it and all that. Then they had to get it painted and everything. But uh, wait a minute, I may think it back. I'm thinking that that bumper might not have been hurt except it was torn a little bit. They didn't want to replace that. But we, did, we replaced all the other essential stuff and just put that bumper back on there. And it cost, you know, like $750. And then we had this 79 TDI Jetta that was done with a PO47A EGR sensor 2 code because the Jetta. The D TDI Jetta, well, that one has two EGR sensors on it, right? Okay, sensor one's at the passenger side shock tower, and number two is hidden under a flexible heat shield near the wall filler cap. Measured sensor output on both of them. They didn't match. We replaced the one that was dead, and that's kind of what it looked like there. And this is where it was mounted at, back there behind us. See, one of them was mounted over here, one of them was mounted over there. And it's wrapped up in this tape right here. If you didn't know a sensor was in there, you know, you probably wouldn't even know to look for it, but that's what it looked like. And so it's kind of like a DPF E-Sensor on a Ford. You can even tell it kind of looks like it and all that, but there was two of them on there. Well, we replaced the intake manifold gasket on my dad's pickup truck, and in the process, we replaced the plastic distributor and the cam sensor with a nice, robust aluminum unit. Now, how many of you guys have heard me talk about camera retard offset on those CSFI trucks? You know what CSFI is, right? Late 90s Chevrolet pickup trucks, they got this spider under the intake, you know what I'm talking about? You've seen those before? All right, now a lot of times whenever somebody does a, a, a intake manifold oil leak job on one of those, they'll put the distributor back in there, they'll get it where it'll start and run, but they'll have the camera retard offset wrong. And if the camera retard offset is off enough, it will just bank fire the injector poppets instead of firing them right and your gas mileage goes to pot. And I don't know how many times I've heard people say I was getting good gas mileage, they put an intake manifold uh, gasket on it, and now I'm getting lousy gas mileage. You know, I was getting 19, now I'm getting 13, something like that. But what you got to do is you got to have a scan tool that will give you camera retard offset. And the the Genesis scan tool we used to use until I get did a, the up, last update that I bought on it had camera retard offset as one of the, in one of the pits on the Chevrolet trucks. What you do is you get it above a thousand RPM, you turn the distributor until it's on zero, until it's reading zero. But you got to have it above a thousand or it won't be accurate. When you get it locked down, you got it set just like it's supposed to be. Well, lo and behold, whenever the Genesis update came, they took the camera retard offset away from us. And so that little scan tool, the little touch screen in the gray box, it has that. And so now we can still do camera retard offset adjustments if we need to. Now, when you check the camera retard offset adjustment on one of the CSFI units, if it's off nowadays, most of the time you just got to put a distributor in it. But when you put the distributor in there, you know, sometimes they'll have it locked where you can't turn the distributor. But if it's got one of those adjustable ones in there, 
you're going to need to bring it up over a thousand RPM, go to camera, turn off that screen on your scan tool, and dial that thing into zero and then lock it down. Matt probably knows about that. I know, but we don't know how to do it. Yeah. But if you look it up, it's hard to find that if you look that up. You know what I'm saying? If you try to look that up in, uh, I don't know if Mitchell's got it now, but for a long time they didn't even mention it. And, uh, and I don't think, I'm not sure all that added or not either. And I don't even remember where I learned it, but it's something you got to do, you know, one way or another. Uh, but so basically, we uh, he had this bucket and jerking thing going on. And we weren't doing anything directly related to bucket and jerking. Summer gets here. All right, we had to replace not only the oil pan gasket, but also the timing cover in order to stop the front leak. The exhaust had to be removed to get the bottom oil cover to pan off. The timing cover was supposed to be replaced if it was ever removed, was broke, but you couldn't see that until the oil pan was removed. You're actually, on those engines, if you pull the timing cover off, you were supposed to put a new timing cover on it. You weren't even supposed to use the old. Yeah, exactly. It actually says it on there, remove if replaced. And, all that. and so, and, uh, anyway, um, the cover wound up being the reason the oil was leaking, so this bucking and jerking got a lot worse to the point it was losing power. And he attempted to bring it back the following week, and it died on the road about 15 miles out. So we had a wrecker pick it up and bring it in, you know, because he was about halfway here when it died. This is the vehicle that died, right? So in May, this is a, this is a sort of a sideline here. In May, the president of the college shows up with an El Dorado. You've seen it. And it was a cream puff looking car, and the engine had been replaced with a rebuilt, it was a 1976 model, the transmission had been rebuilt too. And, but it had died on him on the way back from where he bought it at. And somebody had charged him $1,000 to put a carburetor on it, and it still wouldn't run. And so we finally had it towed on over here. And the reason it wouldn't run, we found out, well, to begin with, whenever we spun the starter, it would just go, eh, it wouldn't do anything. We looked, you know, I'll show you in a minute what was wrong with that. But the reason it wouldn't run was the the spring on the points was broke. And the points were just flopping around in there. They, they couldn't even make it break for the coil, right? All right, so we put points in it. But right here, see the busted tooth on the flywheel. Whenever we took this thing out of here, there was seven teeth busted off that flywheel. Because whenever that starter would kick out and hit that flywheel, them teeth would butt against the flywheel teeth. It just, it had enough force, it would just shear the tooth off. It just pop it off of there. If it didn't go in between those teeth, it would pop one off. And then where, that where it was, people kept turning the engine with a breaker bar, and it would pop off another one ever now and then. Now you gotta think what you gotta do about that. You remember when I told you guys a few weeks ago, my car, I put a starter on it back in uh, November, and I uh, drove it just fine, and then one day, and I drove it to lunch and back, had no problem, and I got ready to leave. It just made a noise like, well, it started spinning before it ever jumped out. There was something wrong inside the starter. So I look at it, it was putting power to the thing before. Anyway, this one wasn't having that problem. It was just kicking out there and busting the teeth off. All right, so we basically, Bobby pulled the transaxle out of that thing. And if you've never pulled a transaxle out of a 71 El Dorado, you've really missed a treat, okay? We get this thing out of here. We get a flywheel. We put it back in there. We actually, this one wasn't the normal Chevrolet starter where the bolts were going up it had bolts going in like a Ford and so I said well we had a 76 engine and we had a 71 transaxle and product variability had the starter not quite lined up right and so basically what we did there was we egg shaped the hole in the housing so you could swing the starter in and adjust it and get it closer and we locked it down we got it just about right or so we thought but he started it for about a week and then pops another tooth off the flywheel. Tell me what you're going to do about this. This is a pain to pull this thing back out. We don't want to have to do this a third time. You know, angle the teeth on the flywheel. That's what I did on that one. I basically took the flywheel and I says, you know, we're going to basically adjust this thing to where it's really perfect. We had to egg the hole some more and get it in some more. But before we even put the flywheel in there when nobody was here but me, I got my high speed cutter and I cut an angle on every flywheel tooth that was opposite of the angle that's on the starter. So that there's no way it's going to hit and knock a tooth off. Ain't no way it can. And it's been starting ever since. I mean, just perfect. You know, if anybody ever pulls that starter off and they don't know how they're supposed to adjust it, they'll probably wind up in a pickle. But anyway, he had to pull the transmission out twice on that one. So the long and the short of it is here we've got situations where uh, let me tell you the rest of the story about the pickup truck too because I didn't have any pictures to go with it but I'm going to tell you the story about that. That was a pain, that uh, CSFI. 
I got, uh, how many of you know that you can get a CSF spider assembly that's fully electronic? You know how the CSFI system works? Not really. Basically, you've got a, you got your solenoids that are up here at the top. And you've got these little poppets down there. And on those CSFI engines, if you don't have sufficient fuel pressure, if you've got like 57 pounds of fuel pressure and it calls for 61, it ain't going to start. Because those poppets actually are sort of, they're vaguely like a diesel. But whenever that pressure goes to that, it opens those little poppets, that's how when the fuel sprays in there. If the pressure is a little too low, it either won't start or run really, really bad. Now, but they have one that you can pull that cover off of that thing, and for about $350, you can actually get elect fully electronic injectors that will go right where those poppet injectors are, and they still fires with the same engine controller and all that kind of stuff. But it never gives all of this trouble like you had before. It basically is an upgrade that's really good. You can actually buy it from GM. Somebody came up with that. And it looks exactly the same. You know, whenever you look at it, you haven't even changed the way it looks. Now, the same wires plug in. It's a beautiful conversion. I don't know if anybody ever seen that before. I'll have pictures of that. But we put that on there. And the thing ran, and it ran better, but it still didn't run right. And so I started working on getting me up a, uh, another engine controller. So I called uh, the salvage yard guy. And, jo and Johnny, he says, I got a bunch of them, but I don't know whether they fit a V6 or a V8 because you can't tell by the number. And I was thinking, well, the little chip that goes inside, it does your calibration, and you take a little cover off, and there's a little chip that you plug in on the inside of those. And it's vaguely similar to the ones they originally had on the older GMs. And he sent me a big wad of these things, and I kept swapping out that chip inside that engine controller until I found one that would make it run right. Because I had determined that that was what the problem was. I don't even remember how I determined that what the problem was. So when we put that one in there, it ran perfect. And he's been driving it. It runs like a solar machine. You can't even hear it running now. Oh, yeah. huh? you, you can't get them. Now, what you can do is you can buy one from, if you call the GM people, they can't get one for you. They're too old. But I called them. There is a place where you can call and get one uh, specially uh, tuned. You know, and Matt may even have the software to do that. But the thing about it is, uh, that little old chip thing was, was what it took. And I actually checked around about buying one because my dad didn't care about the money part of it. He wasn't worried about it. He wasn't trying to save money. But I mean, the more I looked, the more the harder I realized it was going to be to get one like we need. It's got that, that you know, old truck of his, you know, it's got a five liter in it, I think. But anyway, the long and short of it is that thing right there ran so good when we got through with it. But we had to keep chipping away at that and just fighting with it and fighting with it. And finally, we got it where it, the way it was supposed to be. And that was one of those, look right up in there. See that right there on the far right? That engine controller that's on the far right in that, in that shelf. See it? The engine controller that's on the far right. I think that's one like we're talking about right there. Turn it around and look at the other side of it. See that cover? Is that cover bolted on there or can you pull it off? All right. If you pull it off, it's got a chip underneath there. You know what I mean? And that's what I'm talking about. We had to take that cover off that thing and replace, keep replacing that chip with ones out of other units. But the same one, the way I understand it, fits a V8 and a V6, and the only difference is that chip that's on the inside. Is that, that was the way the, the junkyard guy said his book read anyway. But uh, anyway, that's, the, that's the, the big long war story about the Volkswagen. Oh, here's a little addendum, a little epilogue on the Volkswagen story. I eventually, over about a year later, I sold that car that I had traded that girl for. And it had a pretty decent looking paint job on it, about like when I had a picture, to this guy that I knew. And he went straight to the car wash, and whenever he hit it with a high pressure car wash, the paint washed off. <laughs> and he called me and he said, the paint washed off of this car when I hit it with a car wash. I said, well, I just washed it with a bucket of rag. I ain't the one that painted it. I mean, the guy that she bought it from in that little local town, you know, that was a shyster. Apparently, he had just washed the car and had somebody spray paint on it without preparing it properly, you know, without even sanding it or something. But it looked pretty good, really. But anyway, that was a funny little end of that story. Okay, so tell me something that you learned over here. Cars yeah, that's one thing. What else? Don't use a car wash. Don't use a car wash on one of them that's been painted by somebody that just, you know, put it on there. One of my dual enrollment guys, him and his dad sanded down his uh, Grand Prix and used spray cans from the parts house and painted it flat black. And that thing looks good. 
I mean, it looks really good. It looks like a moonshine runner. But, uh, I mean, <laughs> I'm serious. That thing is actually, uh, that flat black paint is very forgiving. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's easy to spray it on there and make it look good. Because, you know, it's not like the other paint is going to try to run off of it if you don't do it right. But, uh, but anyway, that, that winds up our class session today. And I just figured I would tell you.